So this is the slide that we covered last time. Let's see, did we get to another, the second slide? I think we did not get to this slide. Oh, yeah, we did. We talked about variation and we talked about deviation. All right, this is just a list of the four compass errors. Who cares about that? All right, we've covered magnetic variation this is between true north and magnetic north. We've covered magnetic deviation, which is caused by local magnetic fields. The compass card corrects for which local magnetic fields? I would, I would have said all the ones in the aircraft. It doesn't take into account taxiing over a steel plate or flying low over an open pit iron mine. But yes, elect, so that's why we pretty much use the radio off on one because we're going to fly around with the radio. Even when we're VFR, right? We like to listen to our t tunes, right? Any, anybody hook up their headphones to like an MP3 player and they're like head banging on the way to Stockton? Oh, that's just me. Okay. All right. I usually put on a wig to do the head bang. Not just in the car. In the airplane, nobody can see me. But if I head banging in the car, like driving around Fresno, I got a wig. It has a much better effect. Yes, it's true. Yes, I wear a, bl a, a gray wig to, to match my regular hair. All right. So magnetic dip, the lines of flux of... Uh, of the Earth are only parallel to the Earth's surface at the equator. We're far away from the magnetic equator, so that those lines of flux are trying to go down, and so that causes some significant errors. That is, and that's what I'm talking about when I say a vertical component. That is the line of flux right here. The lines of flux of the Earth are not parallel to the ground; they tilt down towards the north. So that's what I'm talking about, vertical component. The lines of flux are trying to point down. It's not weights in it's not weights in the compass card that's floating around that's causing it. Has anybody ever made guacamole? All right. All right. I used to go to parties at the couple of jobs ago. That was what that was my standard was bringing guacamole. I'd usually make two sets, one that was mild with no hot stuff in it. And the other one was, uh, for most people that grow up in the United States, it's too hot for them to enjoy. But I had a job one time where I ate a lot of hot food, and I, it, it changed uh, how, how, how the temperature or the spiciness of I like food. And I realized that if I would t drag, if I dr drugged, dragged, if I drug a magnet through the dirt and you get iron filings on a magnet, and then you pull those off and stick them into the, guacamole and you stir it around and you put the guacamole on, in a bowl that's got enough air in it that it will float in the water. Before you put it in the float in the water, you, uh, hook it, you stick a big magnet on top of it and kind of tap it so the iron filings will all align themselves to the magnetic field of this magnet. And then you take the magnet off and then you stick the bowl and float it in water. It will slowly, very slowly, slowly turn and one side will point towards the North Pole, so you can put north and south on it and then spin the bowl a little bit. And you don't spin it much because it's really, really weak. But if you just turn it off about 10 or 20 degrees and you let go, it takes about 15, 20 seconds. And that guacamole will align itself with the lines of flux of the earth and you actually have magnetic dip. But if you tell anybody you put iron filings that you got out from the dirt, then they don't want to eat it, which is great because then you get to eat it all yourself. So, of course, we all know about north-south turning errors and east-west accelerating decelerating errors, which are going to be on the next two slides. Has anybody ever done that to dip besides me? Does anybody believe that I actually did that? Did anybody believe it for more than a half of a second? I, th I believed it for more than a half of a second. If we had a, I, I, one of these days when I don't have anything better to do, I don't know, I don't really want to waste a good batch of guacamole. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just buy some sour cream. I don't want to waste the avocados. I'll just buy some sour cream and try it. I'll have to make it, I could make a YouTube video and get rich. I could be a YouTuber. My six year old grandson and my 12 year old granddaughter came out to visit this summer, and they talked about YouTubers. Obviously, I think they're watching too much video as children, but that's another discussion. And my, my grandson, Corbin, he's six. He said, when I grow up, I want to move to L.A. and be a YouTuber. 
Why do you want to move to L.A.? Because that's where all the YouTubers are. I didn't even know this phrase existed, YouTuber. I thought, I thought a tuber was like something growing in the ground on the bottom of a plant. Okay, all right. So let's look at north-south turning errors here. Obviously, we all remember from a year ago or from six months ago when we memorized this up for our check rides that north-south turning errors are at their greatest when you're going north or going south. And if you're going east or west, there's no error. And, of course, if you want to take this into account, what does a pilot do? You undershoot when you're rolling out on north, and you overshoot when you're rolling out on south. So that means, in theory, if you're rolling out on a heading of 090 or 270, it's about right. Did I get that right? Did I do that right? Y'all are certified pilots, right? Okay. So... What's the best way? So the only time you're ever going to have to deal with this is when the DG goes out, correct? Somebody say correct. correct. All right, very good. Well, you get a gold star for today. All right, so what are you more likely to do than try to overshoot and undershoot? You're flying IFR. If you're flying VFR, you don't really care. You just go, oh, yeah, it's Stockton's that way. I could have sworn I brought this up in lab. If the DG goes out and you've got to make a 90 degree turn, you could do a timed turn. If you've got to change the heading by 90 degrees, how many seconds will you be in a standard rate turn? 30 seconds. You take the number of degrees 90 and you divide it by 3 degrees per second. So if you have to make a 30 degree turn, you just need to make a turn for 10 seconds. You're going to roll out, wait for the compass to calm down, and then you might have to tweak it by a few degrees. But that's probably going to be more accurate than trying to look at the compass and trying to undershoot and overshoot. But, hey, that's just me. Oh, wait, check it out. It's like I remembered what I was talking about. If you have an inoperative DG, the easiest thing to do is do time turns. On your, in your instrument rating practice, you're going to do some time turns. You probably do most of them in the AATD. Anybody have any questions on this slide? And there's the nice picture, which makes it look, I hate this picture, because it makes it look like you can fly towards magnetic north and fly towards magnetic south and still go in the same direction. Isn't that silly? Does anybody want to look at this picture any longer? Okay, good. So let's talk about east-west acceleration error. When you're on an easterly heading or a westerly heading and the aircraft accelerates or decelerates, So, and does anybody remember what and stands for besides uh, me? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. So, if if I'm accelerating, the compass is going to look like it's turning towards the north. north. And if I'm decelerate, if I'm going east-west and I'm decelerating, the compass is going to look like you're turning towards the south. Okay. So the unos is what you have to do. The ands is what you see. And I bet you, you all know what the next line is going to be. Of course, one could argue in, a, in, a, in an, overly power, an overpowered machine like a Cherokee Warrior II with 160 horsepower in flight, we can accelerate and decelerate like a Massey Ferguson tractor. Actually, I don't know if ex Massey Ferguson can accelerate. Has anybody ever been to one of those tractor pulls where there was a Massey Ferguson? Maybe they can't accelerate. I've, I've never been to a tractor pull. Does anybody have any questions about east-west acceleration error? The only thing added to your private pilot knowledge is that last line. And, of course, here's the fun uh, diagram that we've all seen before. You want to go back? Is that enough time? Should I kind of go forward? I texted with Mr. Luque today. He's out there pumping diesel fuel into Army vehicles and dis disassembling diesel fuel pumps and reassembling them. As any good diesel fuel truck driver in the Army Reserve would do. You good now, Jonathan? Anybody want to look at this picture any longer than this? 
Of course, oscillation errors, you're just going to take an average. I don't know, if it's oscillating so bad that I have to worry about taking an average, that makes me think something's wrong with the engine. Do any of the airplanes at uh, JB Aeronautics have vertical card compasses? That is a compass that looks like a DG. I think I have a picture. I'll show you on the, it's on the next slide, I think. If somebody sends me an email, I would be happy to post these PowerPoints on the Flight 111 Canvas. As long as you understand, you cannot print that out and bring it to the quiz. Of course, I probably can't post it until after class is over anyway. Question? Um, I don't think the one on turned on? Canvas. Say that again? I don't think it's been turned on. Okay, well, I'll go post them and turn them on if you send me an email and remind me. Oh, there's a vertical card compass. Anybody ever seen one of these in real life? Okay. It's got the same errors. They're just not quite as bad because there's still a compass inside of it. Who cares? All right. So, of course, we already know this one. Of course, constant airspeed is just a different way to say that the airplane's not accelerating or decelerating. Did I, did I do something funny? Did I say something funny? I always say something funny? Okay, thanks. It's funny that the screen on the right is different. Just to be clear, A and D is not an acronym for anything. It stands for the word and. Hey, there it goes. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, we're done with compasses. Does anybody know when the next test is? Is that Tuesday next week? So that's a week from today? All right. Everything we cover will be on that test. Even if we're a little behind, if we're a little behind and we haven't covered everything that's on the schedule, we're only going to have on the test what we covered. Does anybody have any question about that? So whatever we get through on Monday or Mr. Luque Montes gets through on Monday, that will be on the test. So I already told him we're behind, and he said he'll just talk twice as fast when he gets here. Where is it? Where'd that go? Well, I thought I put it on here. And I guess I didn't. So I'm going to hit. Ta da! Pedostatic system. Fortunately, we'll be able to go through this reasonably fast because the vast majority of this is a review. So we're going to cover the pedostatic system found in small pipers. That we're going to really be looking at the ones that are on a PA28 Warrior II because I did some reading in the POH and online about people that had a maintenance manual for it. So this is really specific to a PA-28 Warrior II, but unless they change something on that pedo mast, it's going to apply, apply to all small pipers. For instance, I think on the Tomahawk, they don't have an alter, do they have an alternate air knob on most of them? I, they do? Okay, great. And do they have a third hole or three holes on the pedo mast, or are there just two? Depends, huh? I don't know. I never tried looking at them. All right. So, we all know the pedostatic instruments. Oh, wait. I forgot. I want to draw a picture. 
Let's see if I can draw a picture. Yep, and I forgot it. Don't go away. There's a diagram in the Jeppesen, but it doesn't, uh, it's not, it's not really, it's set up for having a separate pitot tube, not a pitot static mast. So we're going to go with this one. Let's see. The first part's going to be the hardest part to draw. That's going to be simulating our pitot static mast. We're going to have a line coming in here. And this is going to be our pitot. There's going to be another line that comes in here and back here. Why is it doing that? And these are, whoops, these are our static ports. So this is the outline, in theory, of a pitot mast. All right. Now we're going to have one, and two, and three, and we're going to have airspeed, and altimeter, and VSI, and you can label it like this on the test. And our pitot only goes into the airspeed. but our static needs to go to all three. Of course, we already know that part. And then we're going to add a couple more things. We're going to add our alternate. I would suggest you draw this big on your paper. Alternate static source. I'm going to draw a little line off of it to remind me that air can get in there under the right condition. And I'm also going to draw this one right here. And this is going to be our uh, Preston? So I'm going to do like I'm like I'm going to do with the, uh, the the vacuum system. I'm going to give you a blank diagram that looks like this, and then I'm going to say label all the parts. If it makes you happier to put AS and ALT and VSI inside those round pieces, that's okay. I don't mind. So I'll give you a chance to write that down, and then we're going to review a few important things that surely you will write down next to this diagram. I'll write it down. Okay, we're doing, we're doing, you're much, much better. Much, much better. Yeah, Jonathan. If the, yes, the question is, if the static pressure inside the static system was incorrect, would the transponder be transmitting an incorrect altitude? And the answer is yes. Okay, so if that's, so if you turn off all to static air source, right. would they just read a lower? It would change by about how many feet? Okay, I was going to say 50, but. Yeah, if you pull the alternate static air source, it's going to show uh, uh, an altitude change. It's going to go down by about 50 feet, approximately. And so your, your encoding altimeter 
or your mode C of your transponder, since it's getting its pressure altitude, pressure from the inside of the static system, it would now be impacted. Now, you don't have to write this down. There are, there are some airplanes where the altimeter has the part that is connected to the transponder, and the altimeter has the part that changes static pressure into digital data. And so there's not an extra transponder box next to, into the static system. But older school airplanes, like you're flying, it's more than likely, unless you look at the airspeed. If you look at the airspeed indicator and it says encoding altimeter, then it's probably exactly like this. There's a separate box. All it is is it's measuring that pressure and converting the pressure altitude into it, into data, and giving it to the transponder so it can transmit it. Yeah. Okay, I have no question. So in a couple of months. Um, yeah. AD, ADSB out. ADSB out. No, because your ADSB out is going to be connected to a WAS capable GPS, Wide Area Augmentation System. It's a very accurate form of GPS, and it'll be transmitting your GPS altitude. So someone here knows. If you get a really accurate altimeter setting and you set it in perfectly, how far off is your altimeter? You've corrected the altitude to altimeter for what? When you set for non-standard pressure. But have you corrected it for some other factor? Have we corrected it for non-standard temperature? No. So that indicated altitude, even though you've set in a correct altimeter setting, you've only corrected it for non-standard pressure. You haven't corrected it for non-standard temperature. The good news, as long as everybody's flying with the same altimeter setting, everybody's off 50 feet or 100 feet, it doesn't matter too much. And in fact, when you go to Class A airspace and you exceed 18,000 feet, you're just going to crank your altimeter over to 2992, and you're, nobody's going to give you altimeter settings anymore. And then you can fly at 500 knots ground speed, and you don't have to reset your altimeter every 10 minutes, which would be ridiculous. And everybody's going to be a little too high. Everybody's going to be a little too low. But relative to each other, it will be great. But up there, you're not only not flying a corrected altitude, flying an altitude corrected for temperature. Up there, you're not flying an altitude corrected for pressure. Everybody's just flying pressure altitudes, which really all you care about there is traffic separation. If you're, if you're at 29,400, who cares? If you're at 28,600, who cares? As long as everybody else is going up and down with you. Okay, the only time, we'll get to it, the only time that you really have to worry flying IFR about that non-standard temperature is when it's well, well below freezing. Like I flew in the U.S. military out of Minot, North Dakota, and I've seen minus 50 Fahrenheit without the wind. Ah. And anybody ever heard that phrase, from high to low, look out below? Remember, that applies for altimeter setting, but our correction, for pressure altitude, but also applies to temperature. So if I'm flying from a high temperature to a low temperature, look out below means I'm going to be lower than my altimeter says. So if you're shooting instrument approaches and you're below, we'll just use below zero Fahrenheit, then you got to start putting in a temperature correction factor to your altimeter. So when you start flying out of uh, the northern United States, then you'll have to worry about it. So let's go back to this thing here. So we've got the pitot tube. There's two kinds of pressure that go in it. There's static pressure and RAM. Jeppesen describes it different for me, and I think I'm better than they are, at least in this one or two sentences, is that the, if you're not moving... Is there static pressure inside the pitot tube, inside of the pitot system? Yeah, if a standard day at sea level, there's 29.92 inches of mercury or 14.73 psi, and there's same amount of pressure inside the static system. So in that case, there's no difference. 14.73 minus 14.73 is zero, so your airspeed indicator reads zero. The airspeed indicator is, I guess I ought to wait for another slide, but the airspeed indicator is really doing a subtraction problem from you. It's, it's ram, ram 
pressure plus static, and then it's subtracting out the static to tell you effectively it's RAM. Okay, let's see what else I want to tell you. So what do we get off of this? We have three instruments that are all hooked up to the static system. Only one of them, the airspeed indicator, in addition to being hooked up to the static system, it's also hooked up to the pitot tube or the pitot system. The transponder gets its uh, pressure altitude out of the static system. And if your static ports were both clogged, then you could pull the alternate static source or alternate static air knob. And now you're going to get pressure from where? Inside the cabin, which will make the altimeter read about 50 feet too low. Okay. I did find some interesting things on the Internet, people trying to decide of those two static holes, those two static ports, which one is the primary and which one is the drain, and I decided not to worry about it. All right, we know what three sp what pedostatic instruments there are. That would be a terribly hard question. What are, what are the pedostatic instruments in an airplane? Man, I hope by now you already know the answer to that. So let's do altimeter first. Of course, there is a sensitive altimeter, also known as an adjustable altimeter. So when you're doing grab card, we all know that when it says adjustable altimeter, it really means sensitive, and that means we can set it with a Colesman window. And there it is, the Colesman window. There's two L's in Colesman. Adjust for non-standard pressure. We already covered the fact that we do not generally correct for non-standard temperature. When's the only time we got to worry about it as an instrument pilot for non-standard temperature? Below zero Fahrenheit. All right, so this is a sensitive or adjustable altimeter. That's what you got to have for IFR. Obviously, you can get an altimeter setting from ATIS, and the AIM says that they recommend. AIM is not regulatory. There's actually no FAR that says how accurate the altimeter has to read, but Jeppesen and everybody else on the planet and your examiner will want you to say if the altimeter is off by more than 75 feet, the altimeter is not accurate enough to fly, and I won't fly. And that's the same number as VFR versus IFR. In theory, if it's off 74.9 feet, you should apply that correction the rest of the flight, but yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not, it's not written in an FAR how far your, your altimeter can be off. It's in the AIM, but AIM is not regulatory. AIM says, everybody else says, and your examiner is going to want you to say, if, the altim if I set it on the Colesman window, and what it indicates is more than 75 feet off of my known altitude on the ramp, then I'm going to say the air altimeter is not accurate enough to fly. Whether it's IFR or VFR, it's the same number. Well, in flight, you can't really check it. Well, well, you could. You can. You could. That it. it then I would. I would write that up. I would probably put it in the white sheets off the top of my head. I, I'm not an instrument technician. I've never worked at a job where I could do an altimeter static system check. Well, actually, a mechanic with an airframe rating could do that. But to do the mode C, the, the automatic altitude reporting test, I don't, I don't have a qualification to do that. It's got to be an instrument shop that has the right equipment and has been approved by the FAA to do it. You don't actually have to be a mechanic to do that. But I've never worked at a place where we did that, so I don't. I've never looked up to see how close that has to be. But 300 feet sounds way too much. So I would. I've never heard that number. You mean how far you're in? in well, that may be that may be their requirement. What is it? What's the requirement as a pilot to know about it? If they're telling me 250, that makes me think that uh, it needs work. That's all they said is that I just get it checked out on the ground. So I, it was a, it's a one out, but I have the issue. It reads 300, about 300 feet low. Actually, you're at right. Well, so if I'm air traffic control and I see, I give you an IFR altitude, especially if you're flying real IFR, and you're flying IFR and I see that you're 300 low, I'm going to call you up 
and ask and confirm that you've got the right altimeter setting and that you're flying that altitude. And then I'm going to go, oh, you're 300 feet off. What I'm seeing is air traffic controllers 300 feet off from what you're seeing. So then the question is, is something wrong with my altimeter and you're really at the wrong altitude? Or is it really just the encoding altimeter parts? And the answer is, you don't know. And flying IFR, I would be very uncomfortable wondering if my altimeter was 300 feet off. Now, granted, you're probably going to land the airplane, and you looked at it before takeoff, so it's almost, I'd say it's very, very likely it's the encoding altimeter part. It's that box. But air traffic control might decide they don't like that, and I don't like scaring air traffic control. And, of course, you still have to set your altitude to within the nearest station. Correction, to within a station that you're within 100 nautical miles of. Here's what's fun. When you're flying IFR, they keep giving you the altimeter settings. When you're flying IFR, you will not have to look up an altimeter setting unless you leave radar contact. So let's say you're flying into Visalia Airport. You might... No, not, not, you might. You're going to call up the ASOS or the AWOS, whatever they got there, on your number two nav, NAVCOM, and that altimeter setting is probably going to be better than the one that you're getting out of the Fresno Yosemite Airport. So that's one of the few times you'd actually go find your own altimeter setting. But if you're en route, generally speaking, when you change over, and when you're doing VFR flight following and you leave Fresno departure, they hand you off to Oakland Center? Depends on which way you're going. What happens if you go south? What's south? It's not Lamore? Lamore? Okay. So whenever you go to another center or RATCON or uh, TRACON, generally speaking, when you get on there, the first thing they do is they give you their altimeter setting. So you're flying at the same relative altitude as everybody else under their control. So that's what's happening in IFR. You're in route, you're not looking up altimeters, but you don't have to worry about it because every time you fly from one sector of air traffic control to another, they're going to give you another altimeter setting. So this stuff is pretty simple. Indicated is whatever's showing on the gauge. Hopefully, you've set it to a good altimeter setting. And if you have set it to a good altimeter setting, then generally, what do we call that? I'd call it MSL corrected for non-standard pressure because it's not, it's not perfect. So most of the time, our indicated is really, really good. Not perfect, but really, really good. And in relation to everybody else, it's the same. How do we get pressure altitude on our altimeter? Set the coals moving to 2992. So if we're climbing in our, in our, uh, we're going to get a, uh, we're going to get a, a T-tail turbo lance. You take a, you take a, a PA28 and you stretch it and put six seats in it. You put this, the, you put a horizontal stabilizer and elevator, elevator up on the top, and now it's a T-tail. And you move the engine forward. Because of center of gravity, you put a big old TIO 540 T for turbocharged, and the thing will produce 290 or 300 horsepower. And then there's a baggage compartment between the instruments and the engine compartment, because the nose is so far stretched out there. And it's turbocharged, so you go, how high can I go? That thing will go past 18,000 feet. Well, I've got an instrument rating. Guess what I can do when I have an instrument rating? I can now go into Class A airspace even with a private, and I can file for flight level 180 or flight level 190, and as I'm climbing up, as soon as that altimeter goes past 18,000 feet, I spin over to the coals from the window, and I crank in 299 or 2, and nobody, even on the radio, reminds me to reset my altimeter. And then I just leave it on 299 or 2 until I start my descent, and I'm going to get clear to an altitude below flight level 180. As soon as I leave that altitude, I'm going to crank it in at sector. Uh, air traffic control is going to give me that altimeter. So that's one place you would fly a pressure altitude as an instrument rated pilot. Of course, density altitude, it's what? 
and pressure. Yeah, yeah, density altitude is we've corrected it for non-standard pressure and temperature. What's the highest elevation anybody flew to this summer? Airport, there where you landed. Anybody exceed 3,000 feet? Air an airport, did you land and take off? Any Tehachapi, what's that, at 4,000 and change? And in a Tomahawk, that's a pretty high density altitude airport. How is, is it got a 4,000 foot runway or 5,000? That's okay. I'm not worried. Hey, can anybody beat 4,000? Uh, is, is Georgetown? Nut tree? Nut tree? The one over by the bay? I don't know. Okay. All right. On a summer day, I bet you the density altitude there was more, was like six. Yeah, it's like, what's the takeoff run in a, in a tomahawk? Yeah, that's a lot for 112 horsepower. It's a good thing you didn't have anybody with you. You had somebody with you? Yeah, he's not light. I'm heavier than him, but, but what? You were at gross weight at 6,000? 6,500. DA. On how long of a runway? Four thousand. Four thousand. Okay. All right. Well, how long a runway? Okay, four thousand. Okay. I think the first time I would ever take off out of Tehachapi at full gross weight, I probably wouldn't want it to be at six thousand five hundred feet. You don't have to remember off the top of your head what the rate of climb was on the book rate of climb was, huh? Yeah, yeah. See, that's outside of my, I'm not complaining, that's outside of my personal minimums. I, when I got my 172, I flew around California for a few days, I went back to Arizona. A couple of weeks later, I take my wife for the first airplane ride I ever take her on in my, I take that back, I, I went with her on a helicopter ride, but I didn't get to fly it. So the first time I took her on an airplane ride, we take off to go to Oceanside Airport, north of San Diego. There's a nice, in any case, uh, we take off and we're two or three hundred, four hundred pounds below gross. But it's like Labor Day morning at 9 a.m. Density altitude was probably, see, if we were at 5,000 feet, it was probably, it was between six and 7,000 feet. And off that one runway in Prescott, the, the ground goes up at about 100 feet per minute. And I was climbing at about 300 feet per minute. So it felt like I was climbing at 200 feet per minute. I was scared. I was scared. So, uh, so after that, I started researching what I could do. I had the propeller blade pitch to a lower pitch. So the RPMs of the engine would go up. I could get more power strokes per minute. And I actually bought an aftermarket exhaust. So the air would leave the engine faster. And I got a full 100 RPM more out of it on takeoff roll. So I actually upped the, the available horsepower legally. And then, and then, sorry, this is the part that's important. Is then I took the data, the, the data out of the pilot operating handbook, and I wrote up a graph, and you, I entered it with density out. You entered it with density altitude, and it would read the maximum gross weight where I would have a 400 foot per minute climb. And that was using the book data, not the fact that I bent the propeller to lower pitch, and not me personally, a propeller shop, and that I put on an aftermarket exhaust because that's how scared I was. I never wanted to have anything less than a 400 foot per minute climb again, especially in, with rising terrain. I was really uncomfortable. Question? Well, if you take off with 100 pounds over gross weight, Unless you're doing strange maneuvers or it's really, really turbulent, you're not going to bend anything. Because let's face it, 100 pounds out of what's max gross weight? 1,600 pounds or 1,400 pounds or something like that? What, what's the max? 1,670? Okay. So you could get into turbulence at gross weight and stress it more than no turbulence at 100 pounds over. Right? Okay. So unless you get into turbulence or you pull, some, pull a lot of Gs, you're not going to damage the airframe which is why people do it and, and they end up getting away with it for a long time until something reaches out of the water like a shark and bites your arm off. Or in other terms, they say it, bite, it bites you in the butt. Have you ever heard that phrase? So that's why you don't want to do that is because it, what, you go to Tehachapi and you're used to loading the airplane up with you and your spouse and full gas 
and and you know four cases of beer in the back because you got to have something that you're thirsty on trips. So uh, so so you keep doing that, and sooner or later you're going to get somewhere where you're unhappy. Luis. Five cases, yeah. Well, it's legal in California as long as you don't drink it in flight. Right. Your passenger, on the other hand, I don't know. I, I guess I shouldn't say that. It's not in the Reedley College pilot, uh, student, uh, student handbook, that no alcoholic beverages to be consumed. Well, the good news is you don't get to carry passengers. Well, now that you're a private pilot, your flight instructor, oh, they wouldn't be able to log time as a flight instructor if they started drinking. They'd have to stop logging time. So, yeah, they would never do that. So they can't drink either. Do you have a question, Jonathan? Only outside of Reedley College, correct? Outside of Reedley College, Reedley College doesn't have any jurisdiction. I'm not recommending in any way, shape, or form the use of alcoholic beverages while on board an airplane. I would never recommend that. I'm just talking about what's legal and what's not in a hypothetical situation that I have never encountered myself, nor shall you, at Reedley College. So true altitude is what? It's your, it's your actual altitude above sea level. sea level. Yeah, I hate this. Don't say it's your true altitude above sea level. I won't give you points for that. It's the actual accurate altitude above sea level. So we would have to take an altimeter setting and then apply some temperature correction factor to it and then twist the Kolsomanov a little bit to get true altitude. But we're pretty close, yes? We're pretty close if we have a good altimeter setting. We're pretty close to true altitude on, or you could say our indicated altitude is pretty close to true unless it gets really, really close, cold. And then, of course, absolute altitude is? Yeah, it's your height above AGL or your altitude above AGL. Or you could say it's the distance between your airplane and the ground directly below you. Of course, we all work on uh, absolute altitude when we're flying around and trying to stay at least 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within 2,000 feet horizontal when we're over congested areas. Like around Reedley, there's this 300 and some odd foot tower at Reedley High School across the way there. So if you want to f f legally fly over Reedley College, you'll be within 2,000 feet horizontally of that tower. So you've got to take, you've got to be at least a thousand feet above the tower. So you got to take that tower and add a thousand feet. That means you're, you'll end up having an absolute altitude of around thirteen hundred. Right. And then you got to right. Well, that's why that's why I like towers and obstructions that have the two altitudes. One's the AGL and one's the MSL. I, that, I'm, I'm a pilot. I only do the math I have to. So I'm going to take the MSL height of, the, of it and add 1,000. All right, the theory of operation of an altimeter. It's got aneroid wafers in there with standard day pressure, and the case connects to the static system. And we're going to see, I think, drawing these things makes uh, it sink in way better. So we're going to see if I can draw an altimeter. And and let's see. Do I'm trying to see if they put their aneroid, if they put their wafer sideways or not? Oh, they put them vertical. Okay. All right. So we put in our wafers. I'm just going to draw two of them, and we have a mechanical connection to a needle. And then So if we have sealed these wafers, or you could call them, you know, they're brass cylindrical flat disks, if you will, that are hollow on the inside. If, it's, if they're sealed up and you change the pressure on the inside or the outside, they're going to expand or contract. And really all that needle altimeter setting is doing, or the altimeter is doing, is changing the position of the needle based on how much these things expand or how much they contract. 
and how much they expand or contract is based on how much air pressure they're exposed to. So you notice the wafers I got going on there, they're not, they're not exposed to anything. Air's not going into them or out of them. And when I grade this diagram on the test, I'm going to be looking specifically for these particular squiggles. Uh, I th I'm going to have to take off partial credit. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, partial credit. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't know. I would be really happy if you could get it from the wafer to a needle in the front. That, that's the part I'm... No, I can't imagine, other than me, anybody asking you to draw the inside of an altimeter. But one of these days, you're going to go up for your CFI check ride, and now you're going to have to, in front of an examiner, explain how an altimeter works. Now, can you show the picture? Oh, heck yeah. And would I recommend you show the picture? Yeah. But I think that, that being able to draw that diagram, you get rid of all this other miscellaneous junk on this diagram that you don't really care about. How does this thing really work? We've got these sealed aneroid means no air. So no air can come in or come out of it. So when somebody says sealed aneroid wafers, that means no air gets or in or goes out. Does anybody have any questions about that? Anybody want to look at this picture anymore? Good. Of course, we know about the high to low lookout below. That applies for temperature, and that applies for pressure. So we could actually go and pressure. And then we wouldn't even have to write this line right here at all. We've already covered the fact that the altimeter setting only corrects for non-standard pressure. And we've already covered the fact that it's extra cold. Essentially, if it's below zero Fahrenheit, then we may need to apply a temperature correction factor. Because let's think about it. You're shooting an instrument approach in the soup, in the clouds. If you're descending lower than you think you are, is this a good thing? Not on an instrument approach. If it's day VFR and you're 100 feet or 200 feet lower than you think, you're going to look out the window and you're probably not going to bash yourself into the ground before you get to the runway. But these instrument approaches that we've flown in the lab, that MDA, that minimum descent altitude we've been leveling off at, is somewhere around four or 500 feet above the touchdown zone of the runway. Being two or 300 feet below that, eh, really what I'm worried about is hitting towers or trees or something. But when we fly an instrument landing system, an ILS, a precision approach, we're generally going to fly down to 200 feet above the touchdown zone. Now you're going to be a quarter, the runway is going to be a quarter of a mile to a half a mile ahead of you. But if you fly to 200 feet above the touchdown zone and your altimeter is set correctly and it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you might only be 100 feet below, 100 feet above the, the ground. Now what if it's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit? You might actually be hitting the runway, uh, the, the airport, uh, airport approach lights, the approach lighting system even though your altimeter says you're 200 feet off the ground. Anybody have any questions about that? Vertical speed, of course, we've all seen them. Somebody tell me about, it's hard to see in this picture, tell me about that little screw in the bottom left-hand corner. Huh? What's up with that screw? Here, I'll turn the lights down. Can you see that little screw in the bottom left-hand corner? The other three screws hold it to the instrument panel. Anybody know what that other screw does? Go ahead. It changes the needle position. So here, let's have, let's have a fun discussion on that. As a pilot, can I reach up there with the screwdriver and rotate that? Am I servicing the airplane am I, or am I performing maintenance on the airplane? Huh? Technically, you're performing maintenance on the airplane. Is if, you, you, if you're performing maintenance, pilots can only do preventive maintenance as outlined in the appendix of the back end of FAR 43. I'll bet you 100 bucks because I've read that a lot. In the back there, it says you can change tires, 
and brake. I think you can do brakes. Yeah, you can do tires and brakes and spark plugs and batteries, and you can change side windows out. You can paint the airplane. If you don't have to balance the control surfaces, you can do the upholstery. I'm not making this up if as long as these things are not complicated, not complex. But it doesn't say adjust the vertical speed indicator. Yes, technically, technically you can't reach over there with any kind of screwdriver and adjust it. So at JB Aeronautics, what would be, do you think if it shows 50 feet down, you think that's enough to uh, ground the airplane? So what's the maximum it can be off and still go fly? Has anybody ever read anything about that? I'm not. Jefferson doesn't even say anything about it. I've read the FARs and the AIM probably more than you have. It doesn't say anywhere in the FARs. It doesn't say anywhere in the AIM or the a Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge how far the VSI can be off and still go fly. All I've ever read is that if it's off, take it into account. So if it shows 100 feet low, then you should use 100 feet low as zero. That's kind of a pain, though, especially when you learn how to be an instrument pilot. So me personally... If that thing looks like it's more than a couple of, knee, you know, more than, if it looks like it's more than 20 or 30 feet off, I'm going to write it up in the, in the white sheet. So the mechanic can go there with a the screwdriver and go, er, and then write a maintenance entry. Adjusted vertical speed, zero indication. And then sign it off because they have an airframe and power plant mechanic certificate. Of course, I would never tell you to reach up there with your own screwdriver and do that because that would be a violation of federal aviation regulations. Unless you have an A&P and you write it in the logbooks. All right, so let's talk about vertical speed. There's a metered orifice or a calibrated leak, and the static source, is, uh, static pressure goes direct to the inside of a diaphragm. Of course, we're going to draw a picture in the diaphragm that looks just like an anaerobic wafer. And, of course, it measures rate of change of altitude, how many hundreds of feet per minute it's changing per minute. And, whoops, I thought I had one more line there. Oh, I should have one more line because I just did it. Oh, I must not have wrote it in there. Okay. What's that? Did I misspell diaphragm? Here, we'll just abbreviate it. If you wrote... Uh, a capsule instead of a diaphragm, I'd be okay with that. So let's think about here. The rate of change is really, really easy because that's what we're used to thinking about, VFR, even the way we've been using it, IFR, or IMC anyway, is it's we want that at least 500 feet per minute climb or at least 500 feet per minute descent generally. How much of a lag is it? What does Jeppesen say? What does Jeppesen say? It's, surely you all read the uh, Jeppesen textbook prior to today. Jeppesen says six to nine seconds lag. So, but here's what's funny. It doesn't, does it feel like that? No. It's because it's set up to show you the trend right away. It's a six to nine second lag on how on it be showing you an accurate number, but if you start descending, there's a weight in there and it makes the needle move. So if you accelerate down or up, it makes the needle move in the correct direction. So it's gonna the needle's gonna move, and t so it it's tricky. It's insidious. It's insidious. Maybe that's not the right word. It feels like it's moving right away and giving you an accurate indication, but the accuracy of the indication is six to nine seconds. But at least at, at when you start going up or down, the needle will start moving, so you can tell if you're going up or down. This is kind of nice if the attitude indicator fails, yes? 
the attitude indicator fails, we get to use the turn coordinator. Remember, we get a little bit of it's going to turn even though we're just banking and we haven't moved the nose yet. Yay. So yay for the vertical speed is that if we start climbing or start descending, the needle's going to move in the direction we're moving. We don't know how much, but at least we can go, oh, maybe the nose is up a little bit too much. I can push it forward just a little tiny bit. So I think for instrument flying, that's really good to know that it's the needle's going to move really fast. It's just not going to be an accurate number for six to nine seconds. So there's that lovely diagram. Let's see if I how well I can do here. I'm going to do a little bit better with that one. So in this case, unlike the altimeter, where the static pressure went into the case and the aneroid wafers, not no air went in or out, in this case, it's very different in the VSI. The... Uh, capsule, it's vented into the static system. And of course, we got our calibrated leak. But hey, this is all a review, yes? Generally, they're built like, uh, I, I, the, yes, to answer your question, if I handed you a, a, a vertical speed indicator, there's going to be a little tiny hole somewhere that says, don't glue this hole up, and then there's going to be a fitting where you can screw in a, an aluminum pipe, and it'll say static. And it's generally on the back side of the instrument. Because if you put it on the sides and you stuffed it in there, you might not be able to get to the side because of the other instruments. So these instruments, all the ones I've seen, the connections are sticking out the direct opposite side to the face. So we could do better. This is the face of the instrument on this side. You know, this is. I could have drawn my arrow differently. Did I lose any? Did I answer your question okay? Well, there it is. Well, here, let's do the errors here. So, calibrated leak, it gives us a six to nine second delay in accurate. You ought to really change that to, for, to and there, I knew I put the trend information in there. At least my brain's not completely fried today. And again, when I'm saying trend information, I'm, all I'm saying is that if you start climbing or descending, the needle will start moving in the correct direction right away. It just won't be accurate as to how fast you're descending or how fast you're climbing for six to nine seconds. And that's all I got for today. 
So I failed to uh, get you which FAA questions to look at, so there'll be zero FAA questions on the quiz tomorrow. Is there any other reading or anything? Oh, I'm glad you said that because... Thank you very much for reminding me. I'm done. You guys can leave whenever you want.